Well, good morning to everybody, and welcome back to the second day. I'd like to have everybody here. There are three things in particular that I'd like to accomplish with the chat today before we adjourn. <clears throat> One of them is to continue to discuss risk assessment, but the piece of this that we want to focus on this morning <clears throat> is how will we use the data that we have from the hazard index, the exposure data, how will we use that information to determine recommendations to CPSC. So we're <clears throat> We, we want to discuss how we make a decision that something might be banned or interim banned or no action today. So that's one of the three things. The other one is <clears throat> we need to review what are the holes in our outline that had the <coughs> amendments on it. Are there particular things that we need to have somebody assume responsibility for that becomes part of the report that we didn't anticipate when we put that outline together earlier. And then the third thing is to be, make sure that we have a discussion about dates for the next meeting before we leave today. One other piece of information, Dr. Chris Borgert has pre presented a paper at the Society of Toxicology meeting recently that is relevant to our topic. And as chat members, we received copies of three poster sessions, posters that were given, but they were difficult to read. Well, Chris brought copies of his poster <coughs> in large enough print that you can read easily. So they're on the table. So if you want the copy of his talk that was given at the SOT meeting, it's there. And it's relevant to anti-androgens and their activity. Any other comments before we start through the discussion on risk decisions this morning? If anything, the weather is getting bad rather than good, but I anticipate that we will be done in time today that hopefully we would not compromise your ability to get home can't speak to those of you going later on this evening, but for this afternoon, I'm hoping that we can get up before the weather goes south. Okay, then you should have had a handout at your desk this morning that was something that I just put together last night after thinking about this some more, and where we stopped yesterday <clears throat> was a suggestion of the possibility that we would begin this discussion about making risk decisions by looking at criteria. And criteria for a ban would be a place to start. So there's an error in here later on. There's a greater than one that should be a less than one under criteria for no action. Uh, <clears throat> otherwise, this is a very, it's a draft of rough thinking, and it's presented only to stimulate discussion. And I would welcome your suggestions for what are better criteria and how to modify these criteria. Some of them require discussion. So, just to get us started, the criteria for a ban, and one of the things that I thought I understood from yesterday is that if there is a hazard index equal to or greater than one, that was a signal that something needed to be done, some kind of a regulatory decision or non-regulatory, but an ex a decision to limit exposure in some way, regulatory or not. Another criterion <coughs> could be that the responses in key toxicity studies are considered relevant for humans. I mean, that's one of the things we want to know before we would impose any kind of an action. And if we know that the, tox the findings in toxicity studies are relevant for humans, and I'm distinguishing assumed relevant here from those that we know to be relevant, 
then it's, it's plausible that we should be concerned about human safety. Another one is that the effects expected or seen in humans are a serious health effect. So we're not talking about dermatitis. We're talking about a health effect that is of considerable concern. It might be mutagenic damage, it might be birth defects, it might be developmental effects that are not malformations, it might be cancer, it might be any one of a number of things that we really wouldn't want to have people experience from, chem from chemical exposure. I think it would be critical that key toxicology studies are replicated with similar results from multiple laboratories so that we would not recommend taking an action on one study from one laboratory even if it was a well-designed study. I think it's important that findings can be replicated in another laboratory before I mean, the yellow flag might be raised at the first finding but it would sure be nice to see it replicated in another lab. It's important that the identity of the toxic agent in animal studies and in the human environment is confirmed with analytical methods of sufficient sensitivity, specificity, and limited detection, again, multiple laboratories, so that we don't have a situation where there's only one lab in the world that can detect this stuff, and they have found it, and they coincidentally have done the tox study as well. That's, that's not a situation that we would want to find ourselves in to make a, a serious regulatory decision. And then also the levels of human exposure are sufficiently high to cause adverse effects in humans. We would know that either from extension of the animal data or from known human experience. I suspect by the time a decision of this kind would be prompted, we would probably have enough human exposure to see if they are showing some signs either through blood levels or urine levels or some toxic response. So th those are my first thoughts in putting down the criteria that might be used to determine a recommendation that something might be banned. <coughs> Discussion. Chris. So one thing I might um a couple things. One, one is um, the the first part about the hazard index being greater than or equal to one. Um, we um, pointed out yesterday that sometimes the hazard index is used as a screening tool uh, when a lot of very diverse chemicals are put together. And in that and in that case, it might be that you know we would go back and and, and look for similar chemicals in constructing the hazard index. I think in what we're working on here is in the case of having similar chemicals. It's not. <coughs> As a, uh, as Andres said yesterday, apples and pears. I think he kept saying. Um, I think we do have apples and apples um, here. Um, when you when you start talking about things uh, being replicated, part of what we're using the toxicology <coughs> studies for to get estimates for points of departure, uh, and you know there's variation in those estimates from a single yeah. study. So. Um, replicated maybe in quotes in the sense of not the exact numbers or whatever, but in the in the ballpark, you know, what's close enough to being replicated. And that's, that's <coughs> the gray part of that. I, and I think what we're seeing yesterday is that, you know, in terms of how we're using these results from multiple studies um, is a little bit of variation in a point of departure uh, estimate may not matter that much. So I guess I, I would just point out how strict you mean by the word replicated. <clears throat> uh, thank you, because I should have expanded on that a little bit more. <clears throat> by replicated, I mean that if you, go, if one laboratory has done a study, let's say they found a significant increase in tumor response in a specific target organ, liver, let's say. By replication, I mean that, that somebody else does another study and it's a, a reasonable strain of animal that has we have laboratory experience in. The study is of sufficient duration to detect a tumor response if there's going to be one. The dose levels are sufficiently high. They don't have to be the same, but they cover the same range that might be determined on the basis of a maximum tolerated dose in case there is a strain difference in sensitivity to the limiting factors. 
as you all know, the NOAIL is largely a function of experimental design and dose selection. So you may have a fair amount of variability in NOAILs just based on how the studies are designed. So in that sense, it would be a lot better to have two of them than it would be just to have one where perhaps the NOAIL is really <coughs> a strange number because the dose levels were spread so widely compared to a tighter one, which you'd have a low oil and a no oil fairly close together. So that's what I meant by replication. It doesn't have to be, in, it shouldn't be in the same lab. It shouldn't necessarily be in the same strain. It might even be in a different species. You might have rat and mouse data. But the ability to replicate, it doesn't have to be a liver tumor. I mean, if it was, sure, it gives you a little more confidence, but if the response in, in the mouse is different than the one in the rat, that's not uncommon. But the fact that you have tumor responses in two different <coughs> studies is pretty significant. So, does that help clarify what I meant by replication? Over. I'd like to come back what Andreas said yesterday. Uh, do we want to use the hazard index, which is actually a risk index, as the sole trigger to talk about the ban or not ban? Or shouldn't we really talk also about the hazard, not also not only the risk? Mm -hmm. So we have seen that uh, the hazard index in itself has a certain variability. We can use case one, which is produces a hazard index of 1.3. And in case two, we have a hazard index of 0.8. So do we want to make a mean of it? So it's 1.1, now it triggers action. No. So I'm a bit reluctant to accept this hard formulation here. If the hazard index is above <coughs> one, it triggers something. I would certainly agree with that. I mean, we, we went over that yesterday with the question of what do you do with a 0.9. So, I didn't mean that any one of these is sufficient to automatically demand that a ban would be recommended. It, it's still a judgment. I mean, even if we had some of these, we might still make a judgment that we would recommend a ban based on three or four of these criteria, that they don't all have to be met. And I agree about looking at the hazard, and that's why I mentioned in here that these expected or seen effects in humans would have a serious health effect. So that, that was getting at the hazard consideration by saying that. Andreas? Um, can I can I just expand on this a little? I, I totally agree with what, what Holger said. Simply because a hazard index uh, exceeds one uh, doesn't mean you, you should ban anything or do anything as such. So, so I think it's also a dangerous criterion to. Um, <clears throat> uh, it, it's a dangerous criterion for any ban or such like things because, as as I said yesterday, imagine um, any form of risk assessment indicates that exposure to DHP currently exceeds. I'm making up numbers here. The the what is considered to be tolerable. So th this could be arrived at by something equivalent to a hazard index consideration, or we can simplify this just for, by, by doing it for a single chemical, the, the standard way. So then if, if you go, want to go down that route, in other words, risk assessment gives the criteria for deciding on a ban or not, you would then decide, okay, DHP should be banned, or the existing ban should be continued. <coughs> Um, in the same way, you might, for example, find that uh, because current exposures to DBP are rather low and uh, therefore the quotient of daily intake and reference dose for the, uh, DBP is below one, very far below one, so that risk assessment consideration would indicate no case to answer. Would you then therefore say, all of a sudden we don't ban DBP? That would be nonsense because if you ban, for example, in this uh, in this thought experiment, if you ban DEHP on the basis of a risk consideration, you open the door for a substitution process whereby, for example, a phthalate like DBP 
could become more used for some sort of any, anything. <coughs> the consequence of that will be that exposure to GDP rises and say in a couple of years time, risk assessors will find, oh, oh now it is um, above what is uh, considered tolerable. And then the game begins again. So uh, from this I deduce that any consideration uh, looking at risk or assessing risks are pretty useless for justifying or otherwise uh, any action like a ban. So that means, in my opinion, that that has to rest solely on consideration of toxicological profile, whether or not the phthalate in question induces elements of the phthalate syndrome, all or some, etc. Such con uh, solely considerations of that nature. <coughs> <coughs> the hazard index considerations, which we um, <coughs> discussed yesterday, they are important, though. They are important vis-à-vis uh, -vis some of the some of the remits, some of the charges we we have to answer in the in section 108. But I would really strongly argue against hanging any decisions on banning something or otherwise on considerations of hazard index or any risk assessment. This will lead into a terrible dilemma. It has to be based, in my opinion, solely on, on hazard, on toxicological profiles. And that's inconsistent with what you said yesterday. If there's no exposure, there is no, there's no reason to ban, even if it is a hazard. I mean, no, no, no. I, that was nonsense. I sometimes say nonsense. <laughs> 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 okay. Uh, oh, oh. Let me take I mean, I, I, and let me put it this way: I would object then seriously with that. With there's no, if there's only a hazard, and it's not an exposure. It's a meaningless thing to ban because no one is being exposed, and why the hell are we bothering with it? So, so therefore, I do not think it was nonsense. I think it's the truth because there are situations and uses of materials where there'll be no exposure. So, just basing it on hazard, I think, is wrong. Let's put it a bit further. For example, let's talk about dipental phthalate. It is known to be one of the most critical phthalates. It's that critical that it's not produced. So there's no exposure, so the hazard index is zero. Mm -hmm. So we could allow it because there's no exposure. If we just waste on one criteria. I don't think this. I yeah, think the so HI the criteria, criteria is has to just be the one itself. Well, hazard and toxicological evaluation. Yeah, but hazard and you. Have, but you said if there was no exposure, all right, you have to find out if it's being used. If it's being, if it's not being used, then the hazard index <coughs> is meaningless because there is no numerator because there's nothing to multiply the numerator. So therefore, the use of the hazard index is bogus. Okay, since there is no use of the material. If there is use in the material, then you can have a hazard index because that means there's somewhere, some person out there who actually is being exposed. And we have to determine whether that exposure is meaningful. So if there's, a, if there's no exposure, the hazard index is a bogus uh, a calculation. Yeah. Yeah. We agree on that. Yeah. Could I, could I just point out, though, that if we had done the work that we've done up to now and we found that the hazard indices <coughs> The distributions that we've been looking at were, you know, down in the neighborhood of, you know, 0 0.0001. You know, given the exposure, given the the uh, toxicology data combined together, we probably walk home and say it's fine not to ban anything because it's so re removed. I think, I think what we're getting at is sort of a, a combination of thinking about all of this together, and that is, we are in a situation now where there are some exposures that are in the region of concern. Uh, it, very likely, if some things are banned, others are going to move around, and the profile is going to change. I, and I think in that situation, <coughs> what Andreas is saying makes a lot of sense, because it's, you know, in the sense that we're in the region of concern, we don't want to get back into that region of concern based on incomplete action without thinking about, you know, alternatives. It would seem <coughs> unlikely that we would recommend banning something based on only one single one of these. It's a composite and it's a judgment. And the recommendation will be a textual description, not 
just ban it. We're not going to produce a list of chemicals that we recommend be banned. So I, I think it would look strange for all of the effort that we're putting into the hazard index evaluation for it not to be considered right. in this list. Yeah. So right. I would leave it there as one of the things that we would consider, and it has value beyond that individual chemical. So one of the things that would be a, a preliminary comment here is that there isn't any one criteria that by itself would determine whether a chemical would be banned, interim banned, or recommended for no action. All of that composite information has to be taken into account. Yes. If you're going to make it, yes, well, I would argue that some some of the criteria have a stronger weight than others. Oh, I would agree. Yes, and depending on the profile of information that's available, that may highlight that there, one is most important for this chemical, another one is most important for another chemical. So the, I would agree that these are not of equal weight. No, in fact, and also let's remind ourselves we are not pontificating about a blanket ban here, where, where this is about use in children's toys. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And when we come to the discussion of interim ban, we may pick up the situation where we have a real strong hunch that this is something that, if we had a little more data, we would probably recommend being banned, but we don't have enough data yet. So we, I think it would, it would uh, dilute the importance of a ban recommendation if we do it on a guess. That's what the interim category is for in my mind. We, it would accomplish the same thing, but it would be a declaration that we didn't have as much comfort in banning this one as we did another one where we had sufficient data to make it clear that that's what the decision was. Chris, did you have another? No. Yeah, can I? Can I uh, <coughs> add something here. I think sure. um, your, your second point, response to the key toxicity studies considered relevant for humans, that's concern for human safety is plausible. Mm. <coughs> can we, um, can I suggest to specify this a little since we're talking about phthalates, so this means the phthalate syndrome in, uh, in relevant animal models. So the, the R are uh, all of or parts of the phthalate syndrome or elements of the phthalate syndrome <coughs> shown to be induced by the phthalate in question in relevant well-conducted animal studies? Do you need to be that specific? Because there are going to be other, won't there be other <coughs> syndromes or effects of what you want to consider? Do you make it that narrow or do you limiting, sort of limiting our decision making? Yeah, no, I, I don't mean it as, a, as an exclusive criteria, but just to, to specify this. Well, maybe you know, it is an EG. It would EG, be fine. yeah. Could it could be an EG be basis. That'd be but fine. It raises an interesting thought that if we had a substitute or a phthalate that was very weak in terms of its causing any of the phthalate syndrome, but it was a that was re repeatedly found to be a hepatic carcinogen. Yes, good point. We couldn't really afford to be silent on that mm -hmm. just because it didn't cause <coughs> hypospadias. <coughs> yeah. Let me do something that I apologize I should have done earlier. Phil, did you get a copy of the email that has this in it? Yes, I have it in front of me. Oh, good. I wanted you to have that too. Okay. Other other discussion. Yeah. We can come <coughs> yes, Paul. I think to the point you're making covering <coughs> all the different criteria band, interim band, etc. And in a sense, they all are important, each one of these bullet things. And I think the idea of the hazard index is the way I've always viewed it is is, is that it, it raises your level of concern. It is not a number that I would want to, you know, benchmark for a ban or not a ban, not a ban. It's just something that says, okay, there's a level of concern. In fact, that's the way it's used. It's basically used as an indicator. Absolutely. And so, therefore, that is not the only this is the only thing that we can base our decisions on. In fact, it shouldn't be. But the rest of these bullets are all just as important, in fact, some are more important than others, you know, at least, at least in my mind, if it's in fact 
known to cause human health effects, well, that's that's level one. You know, because <coughs> it's sort of like the way you deal with carcinogen. Known human health effects, suspected human health effects, et cetera, et cetera. These all fit within that category. I'm sure you base some of your thoughts about this um, on, the, on that point when you develop the work. So I look at this as it's sort of like the weight of evidence on the effects and the exposure side coming together to make a decision. It's neither one or the other, and it's not just one of the variables. It's a host of things where we have to use our best judgment. I mean, that's the way I look at it. They're all relevant. They're all useful. Thank you, Paul. Mike, a question for you. Okay. If, and this is partly what authority you have, and maybe it's semantic to some extent, but again, it comes to my reluctance of, of using the word ban as opposed to restrict. Would there be a circumstance where we might recommend that there would be a restriction? In, in, for some chemicals, it might be 100%, the equivalent of a ban. But in another case, it might be a restriction to a, a particular concentration in products, which isn't a ban. You know, I, I think the whole range of, uh, of uh, risk uh, mitigation activities, uh, risk reduction activities is on the table, except for one, because it's a children's product, we can't just put a label on it. Right. But other than that, uh, every, everything is, uh, is on the table. So you could say, you know, less than a certain percent. Or you could say, you know, you essentially can't use it, which, you know, you'd have to come up with some detection limit or something. But, uh, and also, whatever we're doing, it's, it, it applies to a specific products or class of products. So um, it's not a, a, a blanket thing. And we... <coughs> <clears throat> we typically don't even use the word ban because it's not a, a uh, we wouldn't ban, uh, you know, we're banning the use of a chemical in particular cases. But we haven't, we haven't talked about, for example, restricting it to a tenth of a percent. It's, well, it's, uh, well, <clears throat> the current ban, the, the ban that we have now on children's products specifies 0.1 percent and that's essentially it's a ban but that's a practical sort of detection limit uh, uh, and you know we don't want to worry about trace trace amounts and so on um, so if, if so that's e essentially we're saying you can't use those chemicals in those products It, what I'm asking is if we use the word ban, are we inappropriately restricting the act choices that CPSC has? I don't, I don't think so. I think as long as we're clear what we mean, mm -hmm. um, the lawyers and the commissioners can worry about the wording. Okay. Because if we kind of volunteer to begin to talk about restrictions instead of a ban, well, that's okay. In fact, I think the word, that word, I think the language in the statute uh, says something about restricting yeah. the use. It's, a, you know, it's not necessarily a ban. And I, and I think we, uh, um, as long as we're clear what we mean. We are not being asked to come up with a concentration in products that we consider to be safe. Well, you could, but I mean, we could. But I mean, we're not. You don't have to. No. If we don't get that far, yeah. we would not have failed. Right. And in fact, for the mouthing, at least, uh, most people uh, have abandoned the idea of setting a a concentration. Yeah. Because the migration to, isn't necessarily predictable from the concentration. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, if we use the word restriction, it doesn't mean that we'll limit it to what's out there today. Right. 
We're talking about something less than what's today, we're just not specifying. No, absolutely. Okay, Paul. Well, along those lines, I mean, I mean <clears throat> what you've suggested, Michael, is the notion that there may be classes of products we may say should have none, like things that have teething or potential type type activity associated with it, where kids will titrate this material from the product. So those may be one class that you can consider not just restrictions but banning because of the probability if we find that there's a reasonable amount of titration that can occur among a normal or let's say even a 95 child can lead to high exposures. Whereas let's say there may be some products where you would not find teething that may actually Michael would be outside of that boundary. Is that what you're suggesting? Well, I'm 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 saying if that's appropriate, if the you know the idea is to address whatever risk there is. Got it. All right. So so there's another thing: a concentration and also banning based upon product type and use. There might be another criteria. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. So. The discussion about children's toys makes me think that, you know, the concern I the concern I also have is to pregnant women. Um, when it's when it talks in the in the dis in the description here of um, child care articles and then later on, I mean it's written in a kind of a confusing way. It brings up pregnant women in a lower place. Um, but whatever we could do for protection there as well would be helpful. I think. And important um, for for protection of the unborn or protection of the woman. For protection of the unborn. Yeah. I'd say that's fair. I mean, that that should be part of, that should be part of the game plan too. Sure. It's, so it's not it, just the child's toy. Well, that, I, I'm so just using it as an example, right. but but we I would not exclude. In fact, you're absolutely right, Chris. That that should be part of the constellation of products that you'd say would either fall under direct observation for uh, a ban or a restriction uh, because well, that's of the that impact. Little, a little bit more difficult. Uh, you, you're talking about adult use of products, um, which is very varied. Yeah. What well, is? But we should assume that, <clears throat> for example, cosmetics or health care products that would be used on an adult on a pregnant female, we shouldn't assume that the placenta is a barrier to prevent exposure of the fetus and embryo. The, the assumption should be that it passes across the placenta at a level that is representative of what's in the blood. The biggest issues for them, that would be obviously thermal exposures. Yeah. But Where the, you have to consider the time and concentration and you know, which ones would be more significant. But it could be a significant contribution. Sure. Yeah, and, and just by the way, they, the statute uses the term uh, banned hazardous substance. What that means is a product that doesn't pass or, or doesn't uh, meet a regulation. So it, it doesn't mean the chemicals necessarily banned. It means that product is banned for because it doesn't meet some standard, whether it's a concentration, the type of chemical, the um, okay. the uh, migration, whatever the standard is. That's that's all that means. You mean it's banned for use in that kind of product, you know, the product. Yeah. Itself. Well, it means that product is should be would be recalled or taken off the market until it's been recycled into something else that's more appropriate. Right. That's helpful. Like, thank you. This was, I think, this was a rich discussion. Other comments or, or questions? <coughs> Phil, anything from you on this? Um, well, I, I, I'm listening, and um, several things have, have <coughs> come up. One is, one of your criteria, levels of human exposure are high enough to cause adverse effects in humans. Isn't 
that uh, informed by the hazard index? I understand if if it's greater than one, there's some there's some individuals in the population that may have received uh, a dose of, of combination of phthalates that could be uh, toxic. So if, if that's if I'm right on that, then levels of human exposure are high enough to cause adverse effects in humans. For mm -hmm. example, an HI equal to or greater than one. But that HI is the sum total of all <coughs> the roots. Yes. I think. And so therefore you can't ascribe that to any one product. What you have to well, do that, that's that, the problem I'm having with the, the entire discussion. How can we talk about individual phthalate when we know from biomonitoring data that people are exposed to virtually all of them? Well, the, the point and combined exposure, that's really important if we believe that cumulative exposures um, <coughs> can be toxic, whereas the individual components uh, by themselves would not be. Well, yesterday we pointed out in our discussion that we can't we can't do we can't describe the sources of all exposure to phthalates what we're limited here is our ability to quantify a range of concentrations that are appropriate or associated with one particular class and what we can do by difference or by differential analysis is determine based upon what we learn if the, if, if the hazard index for a particular class of chemicals, I mean, class of products is relatively low, then we have to make some judgments as to whether or not that is a significant contributor or not based upon expert <coughs> judgment. Uh, we can't, you know, you, you're, you're trying to put on to this process a, a an analysis that we don't have enough data to understand, which is basically more, more or less diet, which has very little to do, I think, at this point, to the toy question that we're dealing with. It has a hazard issue, but it's it's, it's not directly under the purview of what we're doing. Uh, Phil, I, I think <coughs> your point your point is valid, and um, this last point can be interpreted in many ways, I think. But your interpretation, I would definitely agree with, <coughs> in along the lines of hazard index uh, exceeding one or. But um, again, I have um, I have similar problems with this, uh, um, similar to the hazard index discussion. So I think this uh, this alone, or this this criteria, I'm not sure this is a useful criterion to to decide on a ban. We we again, let me reiterate, we have other charges. Um, we have to look at exposures. We're supposed to look at. Um, Safe levels, uh, try and derive them, etc., etc. That's all. That's all details in the charge. So we have to do something about it. But it's quite a different question uh, as to whether these uh, give give useful criteria for deciding on a ban or not. So I would have a problem with that last point. Do you feel, uh, Andreas, that? Is the human exposure high enough to cause adverse health effect? Wouldn't you suspect? So I would maybe that the hazard index would be through the roof. Yes, sure, but that's uh, so therefore you know, because the hazard index goes through the roof. Uh, it's not it's not a criterion for deciding uh, on a ban. You know, no, I, I mean, I it's right. The example of DPP. DPP is currently not uh, relevant in terms much in in terms of relevant uh, human exposures and. <coughs> Definitely, the level of human exposure for uh, of DPP are not high enough currently mm -hmm. to cause adverse effects. So, therefore, would you say let's not ban it? This is nonsense. No. Absolute nonsense. We have to be very careful. For example, with DPP, because we know it has a certain toxicological effect profile, right. and we would not want to see DPP in children's toys. Definitely not. But at present time, it's not. Exactly. So therefore, there's no index. There's no relevance of the hazard index. Again, we get back to the fact that forget all this the hazard index. We, well, well, we I don't understand why you keep returning to the hazard because index. Because we're using it's totally it, irrelevant to we're this. We're using 
well, we're using it as a basis for some of the work we're doing. So therefore, if, yes. we, if we ignore it, then we're going to come back and people will say, why did we do it? We're using it in response to point number one and two. Right. Yeah, but we discussed yesterday that these, we have to answer all these charts here, points one through to eight. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's what we're supposed to do. But it is quite a different question in what situation you want to decide on a ban or otherwise. Right, and, and what I think... So for this we have to derive specific separate criteria Absolutely. which do not necessarily have anything to do with the hazard index. And I agree with that. And that's why I'm saying that the hazard <coughs> index for something that's not in toys already <coughs> is not relevant. Yeah. It, it's, 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 well, it's, not, it's not even worth even discussing. Exactly. Well, oh, that's not uh, under dispute anymore. We are, I think we're past that point. Yes, I agree. But the last... The last point down here, which is number the dot, the levels of human exposure are high enough, that may be relevant for certain other chemicals, mm -hmm. and it's part of the mix of discussion that we have about sure. particular yeah. agents. In terms of others, it may not be part of the mix because we won't want to introduce them anyway. So therefore, it's just <coughs> one of a number of different criteria, and we're not going to settle on one to be the main driver in all cases. <coughs> in fact, in some cases, it may not be a driver at all. That's what it's saying yeah. about the hazard index just as well as this one. So we have to use our best judgment. Agreed. So I. <laughs> Anything else before we move on to the interim ban consideration? Well, let's expand the thing. Yeah. Just I guess a comment or question is it's a different direction. It's not one of the six phthalates. It's DEP. Is that something that you know, mm -hmm. feedback we should discuss at all? Or how will that end up in our report? Or would, is it not relevant? Because for, for DEP, you actually have kind of a, a flip um, um, problem, or, or not problem, but um, your DI is, is high. I mean, it's one of the highest exposures for phthalates. But based on the animal data, you know, there's, there's uh, it's not anti-androgenic. But there is some human data, you know, limited human data, the SWAN study with anti-genital distance and one or two other studies. So I just wanted to, it's not one of the six phthalates that are listed in this legislation, but just wanted to put it on the table to remind us to either discuss it and dismiss it, or continue to discuss it in today and in future meetings. Uh, number one says, consider all of the potential health effects <coughs> of the full range of phthalates, right. which so means which I interpret to mean that we would have to consider the EP. Right. Totally agree. Make sure. <coughs> we, we haven't constructed parking lot on paper like somebody else did in a previous meeting, but we need to be sure to keep these nuggets in our own personal parking lot so that we don't lose them. I will. Good. So thanks for bringing it up again. Okay, let's expand the consideration to the interim ban situation, which I've defined as being similar to the situation in which we would discuss a ban, except that one or more of the criteria have not been fully met. It's reasonable to expect that with more laboratory effort in the more effort in the laboratory or in the field, that results will be available to determine if the substance should or should not <coughs> be banned or restricted. And I gave a couple of examples of the situation where there, the evidence <coughs> might be insufficient right now to talk about ban, but there are also components of <coughs> concern that suggest that we wouldn't put it in the category of no concern. So responses to animal tests or research are assumed to be predictive of toxicity in humans for this particular chemical, but further research is needed to be sh certain, to be more certain that such research or to be more certain of the fact that it applies to humans. 
and such research can be conducted in a timely manner. So we're not holding up a decision here for 20 years to develop some new technology to be able to answer this question. The, the answers are in sight. Somebody can do this work technically, and it can be done from the standpoint of being able to get information. So that would be one example where we need, we're uncertain about the application of the animal data to humans. Another one would be where perhaps animal data are, all, are sufficient, but additional <coughs> survey samples to further determine human exposure are needed and can, again, can be obtained in a timely manner. So before we have maybe a few pieces of information that don't seem to fit together very well for human exposure, and we need more to know what's really true before we overreact in either a ban or nothing. So we decided to get more samples, more data, to better characterize human exposure, to be able to do a better risk assessment. So those would be two examples, and there are perhaps better ones, <coughs> where we might conclude that an interim ban is appropriate. So it, in effect, creates a ban or a restriction, but it puts a mark on it that we, we do this recognizing that there are some uncertainties that need to be resolved. How does, how does our discussion in the first hour fit in with this? May I ask a question? Just a question. The, the situation I think we're facing with uh, the IDP and the NOP is less so with the, um, the IDP, but very much so with the NOP. Right? appropriate toxicological data are actually totally absent. Um, how, how does that fit in? So you're looking at structure activity relationships and predicting that this molecule is very similar to one that we know a lot about. Mm. We, would, we would fully expect... Mm. We need to discuss that. Yes. So would... So the first uh, bullet point here, would that uh, capture that situation? I think not quite. It should be, if we want to in have that included, this word <coughs> should be changed to be more mm. inclusive. Mm. We would be remiss if we ignored it, mm. yeah. I think, as mm. a group of people who have been picked to deal with this, if, if we ignore what all of our friends who know about metabolism and toxicity already know, we would be criticized for having ignored something that was obvious to a lot of our colleagues. Mm. On the other hand, there will be other people who say you made a decision based on nothing. No hard evidence, just gut feel. Mm. So how, how can we do better than just gut feel? The, the interim, the designation of an interim ban doesn't mean things go on as usual. That implements a ban. Well, structure, oh. structure activity relationships are another indicator. It's the first level <coughs> of, of concern. The inner band is the first level of concern. We don't know enough, and so we need more data. And if all well, the support for that is structure activity data, we, we basically are still in the position of an interim ban. I don't think because of the fact that that is the first indication of, of the fact that there may in fact be effects. If people want to discount, dis disprove that, well, then do diligence to do the research so that it doesn't exist. I would think that that would be something that would be on the front burner of anyone who is a, producing this particular product. So in the meantime, with the absence of data to disprove ban and with structure activity data being an indicator and the EPA seems to be with you know tox 21 moving more to structure activity data to at least give us some indication to whether or not something is toxic or not I see no way in which we can um, avoid using that information I agree uh, if <clears throat> if we don't if we're silent on it we're giving a pass to a decision to collect no data by manufacturers by whomever has been involved in producing that product and has chosen so far not to collect data on it, we're, we're saying that's okay. By what? By not, By not saying anything. 
by not saying that the ban should continue? Or be implemented, an interim ban. What, by, by, by avoiding the in, interim ban, or yeah. by avoiding the, the notion that the interim ban can, can should continue? No, I'm responding to the situation confused. where we have a gut feel that this chemical ought to be treated, even though there are very little data on this chemical, it's so similar to one that we know a lot about that we shouldn't just ignore it. If we ignore it, we're giving a pass to the manufacturers and the toy yeah. manufacturers who probably know exactly the same thing and have decided not to do anything about it. Because in most cases, that would be a conscious decision. It isn't that it never occurred to them. <laughs> I think we would be giving them a pass. Mike, a little history would be helpful to me. The history of what's happened to interim bans and what does it take to reverse one? Uh, I'm, don't limit it to that way. It's just the, the history of interim bans in the CPSC. Well, I don't, I'm not aware that we've had any interim bans before, before this. So there, there is no history. The only other interim ban I know, I mean, the European Union had, an, had interim, a series of interim bans for the phthalates, which they eventually made permanent. <coughs> That's it. I don't think we've ever done. Uh, well, there, you know, there with the phthalates, we did do. Uh, at one point, manufacturers agreed to take DINP out of certain products voluntarily while we considered, while the previous chap uh, uh, considered uh, the issue. And when it was over, and the chap said that, you know, uh, under the, for that product, and DINP by itself was not a, a hazard to consumers. Uh, it didn't affect the product that, you know, DINP never went back into those products. Mm. So they just moved on. But I'm assuming that the fact that there are interim banned phthalates right now that we're being asked to review right. doesn't dictate, doesn't limit the choices that we have in making a recommendation at this point. Oh, it no. doesn't mean that we automatically have to ban them. Oh, no, not, not in any way. I mean, that's what one big purpose of the chat is whether to continue the interim ban. Right. Thanks. Okay. And, and the reason, well, in the e I, th I think the logic behind the interim ban is that the data were not clear as they were for the, the other the three permanently banned ones. So our choices are no different than if the interim ban hadn't been put there. Mm. We, we, we're starting to know. Yeah. Andres, I'm not sure we have resolved your good question or not about the SAR situation being a sufficient driver to, to make a decision. Other thoughts on that? Well, uh, <laughs> it depends on the detailed analysis. But, but I foresee that these are the issues we have to face. Uh, total absence of adequate data, animal data. Well, that's the majority of chemicals. Yeah. So that's the world we live in. Yeah. But what may, may be a position that we can take on this that would be defendable is that structure activity relationship data may be sufficient to drive a decision. And because we only have SAR data, 
doesn't mean that we are precluded from making a decision. That's right. And I suppose uh, plausibility considerations, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, have to come in there to bridge certain data gaps. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is it is it fair for us? I mean, I put this in here. So, is it fair for me to expect that the answer to the uncertainty can be obtained in a, in a timely manner? So we don't get trapped into a situation where we've, we've made a, we, we have given we made a recommendation that this is interim with the, the prospect that the answer is not in sight either because of technical difficulties or some other reason. You, know, you have to have a GCMS that nobody has designed yet in order to do the analytical work. And we know that that takes 10, 20 years to shake that down before you have two of them in the world that agree with each other. <coughs> Phil, do you have thoughts about the interim ban discussion? Um, has, has the chat Committee re uh, read the um, was it forty page or sixty page document from Exxon Mobil? With oh, well, not page by page. I can't <coughs> speak for everybody, but yes, I read through a lot of it. They're they're arguing. I think that at least two of the three on the interim ban list should be removed from it. Yeah, that, that is noted. Okay. <clears throat> yes, and we I, I think that, you know, we have to, uh, either using these criteria that Burr has come up with or others, um, at some point go uh, valley by valley and uh, come to some decisions. Yeah. Oh, that, yes. And it'll be based on the individuals, and it'll be based on the composite <coughs> exposure. Mm -hmm. Right. You're right. That's that is a step down the road, Jim. Mm -hmm. But hopefully, if we have this discussion now, we won't have these discussions when we're in that process of looking at an individual chemical or combinations. Well, I suspect that the discussions that we're going to have on specific chemicals. While these are, I think, a good set of criteria to start with, the discussions that we'll have will generate others. Oh, there's, I have no doubt about that. <clears throat> if these were so generic that they didn't, that we didn't come up with exceptions later on, they probably wouldn't be very useful. So th there will be, we, we will have to reinvent some new things again. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll have to invent some new things as we go, mm -hmm. based on the data. Yeah. But hopefully this will start as a foundation so that we don't have to go back to the foundation every time. Well, maybe we're, uh, Russ. I guess the, the, the same way I brought, made, made sure that we didn't lose sight of DEP. Um, also making sure we don't lose sight of some of the alternatives, which are also written into the legislation to consider alternatives for right. which we may not have any data or very, very little data. So just to yep. keep that in our sights as well. Thank you. And we're going to come back for discussion at the end of this about those chemicals for which there are no data. <coughs> so you're, you're right. Okay, let's, let's talk about whether or not we need to have criteria for no action or whether that's just a default, that if you can't recommend a ban or an interim ban without further discussion does it automatically fall into no action or do we have some requirements for a no action decision and one of those might be that the hazard index should be less than one so that's the error correct that there adequate studies have characterized toxicity in animals as well as in oil do, do we doing by this I mean it's a well-designed study you have a dose response, you have identification of target organs, 
can you have a tar an identification of the target response in those organs, and you have an OL. And all of it suggests that either by mode of action or by level of exposure required to cause some effect, this is a chemical that we're not particularly concerned about. Is that a requirement, or do we want to be silent on that? And an adequate exposure survey data exists to confirm that human exposures are not high enough to raise concern about human exposure and adverse effects in humans. There may be other considerations here if we, I guess what I'm asking is do, does a chemical fall into the no action category just because we have to put it someplace? Or are there requirements for being a no action kind of a chemical? Can I just ask what precisely is meant by no action? I'm not, not entirely clear about it. For example, it, uh, there are three permanently banned uh, phthalates. We are supposed to consider those. We may come to a conclusion no action necessary, meaning ban should stay permanent. Yeah. yeah. Before, or do you mean no action? Uh, there's some phthalate. We think it doesn't fall into the uh, structure activity realm of those that cause the phthalate syndrome. Therefore, no action. Meaning, um, yeah, use it. Mm -hmm. This I is. I think this needs to be specified a little more. I think we're being asked to identify whether a given chemical should be banned, interim banned, or no ban. So no action may, no action may, 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 may not be the right word, because I think Andreas is right. If something is permanently banned, we don't want to bring that back on the table. And I'm, I'm assuming that <clears throat> by no action means that we leave it in the banned category, the banned designation. We don't, we take no action to change it from that was what I had in mind. Yeah, but this one, that's not reflected here. Then maybe there should be another criteria. Yeah, Something that's already banned will, we will not be recommending to delete it from the no ban category. But we have, we have to indicate that we had an active review of those things that were banned or interim banned to make a decision of whether that should be changed from that. So we didn't ignore those just because there was a decision already made. We clearly have been asked mm -hmm. To review the, right. but but I think Andreas is correct. Is that the criteria here sort of suggests we're talking only about things that are um, going to let go, not ones that are already banned. Okay, so this it, but no further action doesn't make much sense. There's okay, a, so it might be better to say criteria for no change from current regulatory status. Okay, fair. Yeah, yeah, but then what you listed uh, doesn't quite fit that either. Right. I agree. <coughs> Maybe we need, uh, we should call it what you just said, criteria for no change in regulatory status, and then uh, additional criteria for for no ban or right. for want of a better word. Mm -hmm. But what you what what's written here, I think, would fit better under criteria for no ban. Right. I agree totally. Okay, now that's a good observation. Now, do we even need to have a category criteria for no ban? That, that's a default position. Mm. And we could leave it at that. Mm. Because it, it takes an action to either put an interim ban designation on it or a ban. Right. That's the action. The no action is to leave it as it was. Bern? Yes. We we have on our list um, DEP, DPP, and I think we've added DIDP or DIBP. I'm sorry. Um, how are we going? What criteria are we going to use to evaluate those three? They're not banned. They're not an interim ban. Are, are we actually supposed to do anything about? Well, our, our charge says we're supposed to uh, consider all phthalates, and we've limited ourselves to those three additional phthalates plus the phthalate alternatives. So I assume we have to 
come up with a recommendation on each of those as well. Is that true, Mike? Um, you know, I, th I all the phthalates are on the table. Uh, excuse me, uh, all the phthalates are on the table. I mean, we, uh, uh, the CHAP is free to recommend taking action on any other phthalate or a phthalate substitute. Yeah, that's correct. Now, that's what it, it says on the C. It yeah, yeah. doesn't necessarily mean you have to go down a list and say yes, no, maybe, but but it's certainly part of the, the charge. Yeah, that's uh, absolutely right. It says here the, the report to the commission shall make recommendations to the Commission regarding any phthalates or combination of phthalates in addition to those identified in subsection A. Well, that's very clear. So we do need a category uh, criteria for no, not a ban. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So yes. what do you recommend as a criteria for no ban? Yeah, yeah. so yeah. Yes. Could I just point out, I mean, I think this is a, a very important point, and it, it gets to the whole, you know, structure of statistical uh, analyses and the, you know, you assume the null hypothesis and look for evidence of departure. Um, are, are we going to assume something safe unless we find evidence of toxicity, or are we going to follow a precautionary principle and assume that we need to have evidence, you know, of, of quote, safety? Um, Maybe we can narrow the discussion on the criteria for no ban a little bit by taking away those chemicals with no data. Let's jump to the last category because that will take a lot. I mean, there, we couldn't recommend what well, we may have a structure activity relationship. Consider a, an action on one of those, but for the most part, these will be chemicals that we don't have a good structure activity basis for making the decision. There just are no data. Mm -hmm. There may be, it, there may be no exposure data. There may be no animal data. There may be neither. So, well, what I <coughs> say here is simply that chemicals for which little or no toxicity or human exposure data exist remain on the list of chemicals for which inadequate data are available to determine risk to humans. Right. Just leave it there. Otherwise, you jump into a briar patch. So, I so I don't know that we can say anything. So. So that then is a fourth category? Well that's the last one you had. Yeah. Be because you're not you're not putting it in the no band category. No, that's correct. Right. So okay. just to I just wanted to mention that. that as another category and now back into mm -hmm. those chemicals for which we have re we have reason to be concerned because of the volume of production or the structure activity relationship. It was to be suggestive of some biological activity or some other factor that would cause us to look at greater detail on this particular chemical in which there probably is little or no data. But we're going to look at it to identify those that either have sufficient animal and human exposure data to say that there's, there's enough here that suggests there is no exposure of concern and the biological properties are such that it doesn't raise a trigger. So we're going to leave that chemical in a no ban status. There are data that we've looked at, and we have decided there is no basis for recommending a ban. So that's where those chemicals go, mm -hmm. as a, to distinguish them from those for which there are no data. But, but this should be restricted to, I understand this as uh, having, as um, that we have to restrict ourselves to children's toy and child care articles. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So that, that's, but that's another limiting criterion then because uh, not all satellites, I guess, are ever likely to turn up in child, mm -hmm. child's toys or child care articles. Is that correct, Olga? Your point is well taken. We're not looking at a global ban. But that goes Valley. against what we talked about with pregnant women, exposure to pregnant women. 
Well, same thing as eat certain products that are associated with that. So it's not so just child care parties or child, I mean, child toys or child care products. It's it can be products that are associated with the um, pregnant women. I thought that we agreed before that that's carried in with the same umbrella. But there are other products that are used for other purposes that have no possibility of being in either one of those categories. And I think Andreas is correct. We have to limit ourselves to where we have a degree of um, responsibility. Yeah, I'm not sure we have to limit ourselves, uh, but that's definitely what we have to address. Highest priority. Well, I guess. Yeah, okay. We don't have to, in terms of discussion, but in terms of making recommendations, yeah, yeah. we have to limit ourselves to those other areas. But I have to say, I mean, you know, from a public health perspective, lack of data does not mean safety. Correct. And yeah. to, to allow for chemicals that are in wide use to be in wide use um, without any data to support, you know, reasonable safety criteria is a problem to me. Um, I know that I'm jumping into the frying pan by saying that, but... Um, well, Chris, that's, that's why there's a... I want to make sure there was that fourth category, because you're not putting it in the no ban category because you don't have the data to suggest that it's toxic. This is a category is just saying we don't, we don't know anything about it. We don't know if it's safe. But we the action, um, what I'm concerned about is that the oh, action the from action that is going to be yeah. just let it go. And I, and I worry about that. Well, we haven't, talk, we haven't talked about that, though. You know, whether that would be our action or not. Okay. I don't think we have, right? We've just talked about defining a fourth category, but we haven't determined. Well, that question has to be brought up. What action do it we, would lead to? <coughs> do, do we have any basis for making an action? Or do on the flip side, do we have any basis for not making? Well, an I'm action? just saying yeah. that's why it's in the category. We have no right. basis for making an action or not making an action. We're right. basically in a never never land. Right. If you don't do anything, you've done something. Right. But if you do something, you've done something, and yeah, have so you done something that's credible and can be held up with challenge? And when there's no data, challenge will be very, very substantial. But can I can I therefore suggest a simplification? So we need criteria for a ban. We need criteria for an intermediate ban. Can I suggest that we abandon these criteria for no action? <coughs> I just noticed again and reminded myself that we're supposed to do a de novo analysis. So it wouldn't make sense to leave this out and then have uh, the third criterion, uh, criteria for well, not, not recommending a ban or regulatory action or something like that. It could be formulated in a more brilliant way, I'm sure. But <laughs> I'm trying to catch where you're heading, because we have two categories. Yeah, no ban, intermediate ban, and then no regulatory action. But we still need that fourth category where we won't have data to make that. Oh, yes, and no decision. data, yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we have no data, yeah. so we can't. I'm having beyond the scope of what we can do without data. I'm having second thoughts about the phrase no data because there are chemicals out there that have a trivial amount of data that are mm -hmm. totally insufficient mm -hmm. to make a decision, mm -hmm. but they're not no data. Well, there's not sufficient sufficient data yeah. for one of the other three categories. Right, right. right. So I, I would just change that to, to the chemicals with inadequate data mm -hmm. yeah. instead of no data. Yeah. yeah. That gives us a little more wiggle room. Yeah. Yes. But it still doesn't satisfy Chris because there are things we can't do. Right. Because we don't have information that will not stand up under scrutiny. But Chris is right. This. If we identify one of those as one of the 50,000 or so chemicals in commerce for mm -hmm. which there are no data. That's it. That was a struggle we had with within the National Toxicology Program because there was an expectation that the NTP was going to shorten that list. Well, there's no single organization in the world that can do that. sufficiently work on a list of 50 to 65,000 chemicals. Which grows every day. So it, it ends up being a prioritization <laughs> process, if we identify chemicals, again, structurally, that we think 
are so important that they shouldn't be ignored, then we can make recommendations in the report that there are certain chemicals that warrant follow-up and be specific about the basis for us mm -hmm. saying that and what we would recommend be done. Mm -hmm. Is it human exposure data? Is it more tox data? Is it both? Is it not toxicology data itself? Is it mode of action data? So we can make those recommendations. Yep. But then you're raising the point, Andrea, so whether or not we should, in fact, not identify criteria for no regulatory action. In, in the sense of, say, no, not moving any phthalate in or out of the categories where they are placed at the moment. I think that's not, that's very confusing. So I would suggest to leave this out and not consider it with the justification that we are supposed to do de novo deliberations. Okay, so we'll, we'll have chemicals, we'll make recommendations for a ban or an interim ban. Yeah. We will, we will try to get recognition for a group of chemicals for which there are inadequate data, mm -hmm. and we'll be essentially silent on all the rest. Mm -hmm. So there will be some chemicals that have enough data to judge the toxicity and the human exposure, but they don't warrant, there, there's no need for a ban right. of any kind. So I by default, we're silent on those. Is that the position that we want to take? Is that what you're suggesting? <coughs> um, Maybe not. No. No. Well, I, I agree with the with the uh, former categories which you which you um, enunciated, but I'm not sure about. I think we need a bit more thought about it. May, I mean, when there's no data, you can't. This is a real or. If there is inadequate data, that's a real um, dilemma. You know, the both positions then are, then are difficult to maintain. Uh, the position to do to spiral into uh, regulatory action simply because inadequate data are there is difficult to maintain, as well as mm -hmm. the one uh, that says don't do anything uh, because that raises fears, like Chris has just uh, verbalized. So we need a bit more thought about that. Yeah, we, we can do that. That's and this can be a, a conclusion from today. I guess my my thought is the category of chemicals on which there are no data make me nervous. It would be nice. And so the flip side of that is to recognize those organizations that have collected the data, and just because they don't indicate a yellow or a red flag doesn't mean we should ignore them. We should recognize that there are chemicals out there where there are adequate data and there's no concern. In the same way that we're going to highlight chemical, the category of chemicals for which there are no data. And we don't know the level of concern. Mm -hmm. yeah. It'd be nice to recognize yeah. those institutions, those companies, those manufacturers who have bit the bullet and invested money and collected the data to confirm that there is no particular action needed here. Be nice yeah. to recognize that. I agree. Because that's the model we'd like to see followed more often. So, F, so category three and four basically come down to one data has been collected, but there's not an adequate amount of information to make any act. Data when there's been a situation with, with no data of any substantial amount collected to even consider that the data where there is there's collected where there's a possibility that no action decision or a, a no a non no thing <laughs> a use yeah. decision can be made. So you have those three categories. And in each one there's a more the, the farther and farther we get away from data, the more fuzzy any decision can be made would be, and that would tend to make me want to feel that you know we just have to make a statement that in 
in those cases, it's inadequate. We can't make a decision. Doesn't mean it's you know good, bad, or ugly. It's just the fact that somewhere along the line, somebody's got to bite the bullet and say this is what we have to collect. Yeah. I would like to preserve our ability to pull that chemical out that all we know is the structure. And there are no data to pull that out and highlight it. Yeah, I, don't, I don't want to put that in an, in an untouchable category. Yeah. So the risk assessment is not sufficiently sophisticated enough to capture that as being the be all and end all for making a decision. Sorry to plow this ground again, then, but how many categories do we have? Well, I'm I'm not sure. Um, well, we have the the ones for for permanent ban, intermediate, intermediate. ban, then the ones where uh, we acknowledge no fears or concerns are raised, mm -hmm. and then the, the fourth bin for chemicals okay. where yeah. Yeah. no adequate data. I think yeah, that's no where we are now. Anybody disagree with that? Yeah, I think that's good. Yes, but I'd like to put the I'd like that no adequate data shouldn't be a a, a, a place where people want to be. Right. You, yeah. You know, and and I don't know. Just by saying no adequate data, it seems to me it's sort of a let them go with it. And um, again, for public health, I don't I don't really like that. So well, in in the report, we can make comment on that. Yeah. 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 Discuss it, you know, so it wouldn't just end up that they're there without any discussion about difficulties of ending up in that category. But the action is what I'm no, no, about yeah. at the end. What, it, what are we going to say about it? Well, just I don't know what we're going to say about it, but there are at least two actions that, well, three actions that can happen. One of them is that we bring it to the attention of the regulators, FDA and EPA, that. Here's a category of chemicals that you ought to be concerned about because there are no data. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and you have to be concerned of those about those for which we recommend a ban or an interim ban. That requires immediate attention <coughs> on your part, but don't ignore those that are in that category where there are no data because we don't know where they belong until we have more data. So that the regulators need to pay attention to that and we can highlight that. We can, th 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 then you have the categories organizations that can collect data. So that might be CDC, it might be NTP, it might be NIH, NSF. Uh, there are a variety of organizations that can fund research to help yep. shorten that list. Then you have the watchdogs who are looking for that kind of a list to get media attention to, hey, look at how many chemicals we have in commerce on which there are no data and the regulars are doing nothing. So. Those those are the outlets I think for the lot information. Of, a lot of industry to collect data. Right. I think they'd be and, and industry itself. Yeah. I mean, the industry knows this list better than we do. But, sure. but you're right. That's another. That that's the target here is to get people to step up to the line and say, well, we're going to do something about it. Oh, we. Oh, they could be put into the intermediate band category. Yeah, I think that would be hard to defend. And an unnecessary burden to the economy at this time when we're already struggling. So you're right, but I'm, I would not encourage that. But we could call them, you, you, you could call them instead of the chemi uh, chemicals with an adequate data, chemicals where more data are needed. Make it a yeah. positive sure. statement. We can do that. Now are these all chemicals that are used currently in um, children's products and products that be used by pregnant women? Some of the alternatives here? Some of the ones where there's inadequate data. Yeah. So that leads us to say a little bit more strongly that they are used in <coughs> products that can lead to exposures among the sensitive groups mm -hmm. and that it is incumbent upon us to make sure that people are protected so therefore adequate data needs to be collected. We just can't put our heads in the sand. I think 
get a little bit more strength because it, if, it, if it is yeah. using the products of concern, then we then do diligence by saying that there are products out there that use it. We don't have enough data. And then I think Mike's point is the data should be correct. <coughs> I would assume that some of those chemicals are there because of the performance that they bring to the product. Others are there because they follow along with other chemicals that are there right. because of their performance. Right. And they're just there. Mm -hmm. not, not intentionally added, but they are sorted out. They're not cleaned up, removed. Where they have a useful purpose and be incumbent to demonstrate that they don't pose harm. So we, I think we've clarified that we have four categories. Phil, what do you think of that? I'm still confused, but I think it's maybe the early morning and lack of caffeine. <laughs> well, we can take care of the caffeine. We can't take care of the early morning anymore. <laughs> but Holger, I think I need some. Coffee. Yeah, let's take let's take, take a break. fifteen minute break and think about this, and then come back after that. Yeah. Yes. Give me a call. I'll hang up and give me a call, would you? We'll give you a call in 15 minutes. Sure. Uh, before that. Lisa. Lisa. Before that? Oh, you're yes. sure. Yes. Or do you want, you want me to call you? I wanted to chat with you about. Oh, okay. I'll give you a call. Oh, yeah. We've got the number here. I'll, I'll give you a call. So. Okay, let, let's reconvene. <clears throat> Just thinking of how we want to use our time the rest of the morning, what I would recommend is that we continue this discussion. I think the more we talk about it, the more we sort it out and get things sorted straight. Phil has a couple of questions for us to continue to discuss. I would suggest that we plan to wind up this discussion by 12. That gives us from 12 to 1 to talk about what other assignments need to be made. And I think the discussion about the date for the next time will be relatively brief with the plan that we would be done by 1 o'clock and not break for lunch. You can do whatever you want for lunch after that. Phil, if you want to open the discussion of a couple of points of concern that you have, and then we can continue that discussion. Okay, I, have, I need clarification on, on several um, issues. One is, um, which phthalates exactly are we going to apply the criteria that we've been talking about this morning? My understanding is that we were going to restrict our discussions to the three permanently banned, the three interim banned, um, four additional phthalates not banned by CPFC, i.e. dimethyl, diethyl, dipental, and DIBP, and then six alternatives. And as I listened to the discussion, it seemed at times that we were going to go well beyond that. <coughs> so I think we need to come to a decision. Are we going to stick with these 16 or are we going to go beyond that? <coughs> and let me just give you my other uh, area of concern. Uh, and that has to do with the, the hazard index, which is one of the criteria that we may or may not be using. But my understanding is that we don't, and we, I may be wrong on this, we don't have hazard, hazard indices for each individual phthalate that, by the analysis that Chris and Holger did, but we have a hazard index for seven phthalates together. 
And if that's the case, then how do we use hazard index in any event when we're talking about a specific valley and whether it needs to be banned, not banned, or put on interim ban? Um, and the other issue I have is if we use these criteria that we were been talking about this morning, for example, to, to criteria that have to be met to ban something, don't we, by definition, if we don't fulfill any of those, that we would not ban something? So if, if uh, it had a hazard index below one, if there were no responses in key toxicity studies considered relevant for humans, uh, if there were no effects suspected or seen in humans that, that had a serious health effect, etc., then wouldn't we by definition not ban them? So the, the third category criteria for no ban really are the converse of the criteria for <laughs> ban. Well, those are my three issues. Let's start with the first one. What are the chemicals that we're going to work on? Well, well the the um, the charge is is slightly uh, ambivalent there, um, and under number B, it speaks of uh, to complete an examination of the full range of phthalates that are used in products for children. Etc. Uh, Etc. Et so, uh, on the other hand, later on under under number C report uh, and shall make recommendations to the commission regarding any phthalates or combinations in addition to those identified in subsection A. So, I. I'm afraid we're grappling with a very badly drafted piece of legislation here. <coughs> that's our dilemma. And I think that's why in earlier discussions we, we s said that there was a rationale for identifying these 16 <coughs> chemicals and there was a rationale for not worrying about a lot of those beyond those 16 because of the lack of data. So my understanding was that we were going to focus on those 16, and if there were others that we wanted to specifically reach out and say something about, we would. But otherwise, we would collectively say that these are the ones that we focused our efforts on in this review, and there, we recognize that there are hundreds of other chemicals that are beyond that that we didn't look at in any detail. <coughs> and to justify why we did that. Yeah. Is well, that work? I, I personally would be very happy with restricting it to the 16 we discussed earlier. The question is uh, whether we are in, whether we are sh falling short of, of the charge of what we're supposed to do. Maybe we need a uh, little help with interpreting this from Mike. From Mike. Yeah. Well, I think that um, I mean, the charge says the full range of phthalates. I think that e that in itself is not a, a hard number. And I think, uh, like all aspects of this, it, it's a broad charge. And you, you should do what you uh, reasonably can. Uh, as far as the, the entire scope of, of phthalates goes, uh, we've identified, I, I think, about 30 and we're going to have touch reviews of all of those. Many of them are data poor. Uh, I would like to, I know we're, we're getting far along in the process, but I would like to uh, maybe categorize them somehow uh, so that they're uh, a, a little bit easier for the chap to think about um, in terms of health effects, you know. Uh, Categorize them by structure and so on into 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 groups that might make it easier to get a handle on. Um, and uh, it, of course, as far as the uh, as far as phthalate syndrome goes, 
we have a pretty good idea of what the structure activity relationship is. So we know what to suspect. Um, although who knows there could be some surprises but we I, I think we have a pretty good handle on that <coughs> uh, uh, as far as the substitutes goes I mean you could go on forever I think the number we have is uh, it, it, in my mind it adequately addresses the potential substitutes uh, reasonably The number being yeah, Mike, I think what we need in your uh, assessment of, of all the phthalates and the alternatives is, you know, production levels, um, uses. I mean, if, if they're used in, in products that humans are exposed to, you know, that's a consideration we need to take into account. Um, so that kind of information, I think, would be very helpful for us, at least for me. Yeah. Yeah, I think that would be very helpful, and and we uh, we that. need to work. We've started it, but we need to we need to get that moving. But but could we, as chat, not make an informed decision and say we we focus now on those sixteen products? We can justify this. But I think we should in the report by by we are restricting <coughs> ourselves to these sixteen. But uh, I yeah. think it is very plausible, very justifiable. But could we not do this? I think we've already made that decision in Good. earlier meetings. Yeah, and I, I thought so as well. But yeah. the discussion <coughs> this morning uh, sort of led me to believe that maybe we hadn't. So the, the question is whether we want to change that decision that we made earlier, and I don't see any heads nodding in a direction that would suggest that we ought to change it. So uh, assume that we're going to continue with this sixth group of 16 as the highest priority. Mm -hmm. Holger? Has dipental phthalate been on the list? Um, has this been on the list? Do you know, Mike? Um. Uncle, I can't hear you. Yeah, I, I thought it. I thought it was He's whispering. <laughs> I thought dipental was on the. Holger asked if dipental's on the list, and I thought it was, but I think yes, it's. It I think okay. it's one where we're still waiting for the. Is it one we're still waiting for? No, but Phil says it's on the list. Okay. Oh, okay. Good. We made a wise decision then. <laughs> well, I, I, for for me, I'd like to. Uh, Clarify what's actually on the list, but maybe we could do that by email. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, when we talk about assignments, that's one that I'm going to come back to. So, we, we're done with the discussion of the list. Okay, what about the HIs on the individual phthalates? There, there is no such thing as an HI on an individual phthalate. It's then called hazard quotient or yes. usual. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So. Um, I don't know whether that clarifies your question, Phil, but... Uh, how, do you, how do you apply an HI then to an individual phthalate, which is what we're being asked to do? So when we talk about um, DVP and whether it should remain in the band, we're going to use the criteria on Burns' list. How do we use the HI information that we have no, no, on you, seven phthalates, not just... This may be a misunderstanding. Uh, HI, by definition, always means that you're dealing with a with several with a sum of hazard quotients. So uh, <coughs> that that may be a misunderstanding. And also the other point was um, how can an HI be operated for phthalates where we have no data about potency? Of course, it can't, and I don't think that uh, Chris. And Olga have done that. But but I think the HI where you're summing one thing is a hazard quotient. So we could we could think of that as a general right. yeah. so right. So in, in that in that regard, um, Phil, the work that um, Holger and I have done um, to date, we focused on the combinations, but we have talked about you know producing um, maybe some plots of the distributions that we see for the hazard um, uh, 
quotient, I guess, with reference values uh, for the reference doses from various sources on the same plot. So, um, and we've talked about uh, maybe having that in an earlier chapter um, and not in the, the combination hazard index part. So we are trying to address that. We haven't discussed it um, maybe when you've been online. Yeah. So what, what we would, what you're doing or what you're saying is that instead of using the HI when we talk about individual chemicals, we would use the hazard quotient for that yeah. chemical. Yeah. Yeah. That's correct. Absolutely. So, you know, maybe we need to modify the criteria then. Yes, I agree. So, I, I, as I said earlier, I think the hazard index really informs us about the last dot on the criteria for ban, i.e. levels of human exposure are high enough to cause adverse effects in humans. To my mind, that's what the hazard index does or doesn't do. In other words, if it's over one, we have reason to suspect there, there could be an adverse effect in humans. Is that not right? Uh, Yes, that, that could be so, that could be so, but be, before we, again, I, I reiterate, uh, we have to remind ourselves that under point B in, in the law, um, B point number two, it says, consider the potential health effects of, such, of, of each of these phthalates, both in isolation and in combination with other phthalates. So that we have to do, and the hazard index um, the hazard index approach may be helpful in addressing this part of the charge. But as I suggested yesterday, so the charge clearly says we have to do something like that. We have to consider this. So we are going to and the hazard index considerations are are helpful there. But that, in my mind, has to be separated from any question relating to criteria for justifying or otherwise a ban. You see, so we, we have to do hazard index or, or consideration of combination effects anyway, but that, I think, is separate from, from anything relating to recommending a ban or otherwise, which we also have to do. It's a first order, it's a first order worth of information and anything else beyond that is more important. It just basically yeah. tells us sensibly whether we raise our antenna or we don't. Yeah. yeah. But that, that brings us another point that I would like some clarification on from the committee. Uh, if, you, if you take the, the, the biomonitoring data at face value, what it tells you is that humans are exposed to phthalates doesn't tell you where they come from. No. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's what we've been saying two days. Yeah, but so how can we restrict ourselves in our analysis of whether to ban something only based on information related to its presence in toys or cosmetics that pregnant women might be exposed to and ignore all other modes of exposure. I, I don't see how we can do this. Well, that's where the work that we're doing on exposure characterization comes in. We will do estimates of the amount of daily intake for the different types of products and the activities surrounding those products that would lead to the bioaccumulation of those materials and then compare it to the overall body burden of the individual chemicals or all, all phthalates that are in the human being. All you can do there is give a relative ranking in whether or not... I understand, that. I understand that, that's, that's an important thing to do, especially if you want to put in place restrictions. So right. you say, uh, we know that exposure occurs through house dust so you know everybody has to vacuum their house every day to or, reduce exposure or but more important or more importantly that we know that the exposure potential for using certain cosmetics with phthalates in it in it are high find a replacement that that i think is a more appropriate way to look at it from the standpoint yeah. of the charge yeah. that we have that's an example right. but my point is that despite all of that we already know from biomonitoring data that we are exposed to a whole range of phthalates. Right. And I, I think t 
to consider whether or not to ban something without taking that into account, which I think the hazard index nicely does, unless I misunderstand, I, I think we're missing the boat. I think we are going to take that into account. I think part of our discussion yesterday, maybe you missed it in the morning, indicated that we are going to take into account the fact that there's a constellation of other potential routes of exposure and uh, 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 sources of exposure that has to be considered beyond what we can do with our limited ability within the charge of this committee. And it, not just saying that in isolation we solved the world's problem. Yeah. Well, I understand that, but I, what I'm getting at is how do we apply that to our decisions about whether we're going to ban or not ban or, or whatever, a particular uh, phthalate. I, I, I'm confused as to how that's going to be done, and maybe that will all fall out as we, you know, use these criteria and discuss, you know, DBP based on these criteria. Where would it fall? Would it be banned? Would it be an interim ban or what? Maybe that will fall out, and I'll understand it. But right now, I don't understand how how we um, are going to apply these criteria to individual chemicals when we know that people are exposed to, to probably all of these or most of these. I think we'll have to just note that your problem and it's basically a problem that we all have I think in some degree but we just have to live within the charge that we're dealt with. At least that's my opinion. I, I, mean, I have the same conundrum you do but I think the only thing we can do is just, I think uh, Andreas has said quite clearly a number of times today, we have a limited vehicle to operate with in terms of banning, meaning children's toys and products that could be used by pregnant, pregnant women, and let's do the best we can with that and use that as a basis for people to consider for other, other types of materials and sources. Hey, I, I mean, I, I just... I, I think you come to different conclusions if you limit yourself. Because if you, if you say that exposures that are relevant to CPSC do not rise to a level of concern, when we know that taken in the aggregate from all exposures that they would rise to a level of concern, I, I don't see how we can do that. Am I making myself clear? No, no I don't. See, I, I look. We do this with every other chemical that we I've ever dealt with. Dealt with. This is banning. Where do you make? Where do you put your action? And how do you act accordingly? You know, with lead it has many sources. Benzene has many sources. You have different regulations for different agencies that can control the emissions or the banning of lead or uh, benzene. You have to work from what your agency or your legislative mandate is. You go in beyond that, all you can do is recommend that there's a whole bunch of other stuff out there and you have to consider it. I, I, I just don't, I mean, I've done this before and it, it's, that's the only way you can work. But I think... I think is that you? Uh, you agree with that? Um, yeah, yeah. Yes, I mean, that's that's the system that we have. Um, it, you know, the, the charge goes well beyond our jurisdiction, but we have to, you know, the, in the end, the recommendations are going to be uh, related to only to consumer products and not sources beyond that. We're, we're considering the exposures uh, from the other sources. Okay, so let me, let me pose it this way. If you know that in the products that you can regulate, EBP, just for example, is, is found by our analysis not to be a, a particular problem for humans based on exposure, based on whatever, but you know that children are exposed to DBP by a variety of other 
months of exposure where when you add those in, there is a level of concern. Would you not ban DBP because in the products you regulate, it doesn't rise to a level of concern? I, I, I think that is, is, a, is within the chat's purview to recommend to ban or not ban based on that. And it's also the commission ultimately would decide whether the, the portion that comes from children's products uh, warrants a ban or a regulation or not. Uh, in a case where, you know, if we were looking at lead or even some other, some other chemical where there's a significant background exposure, we consider that background exposure or we can in setting any kind of a regulation. This is a little bit, this is kind of stretching that situation because the, the quote unquote background might be greater than the product specific exposures. Uh, but, you know, this is uh, what we are going to do and uh, the CHAP will make its recommendations based on public health. The commission will make a decision uh, based on public health as well as the you know regulatory framework and then um, we know that other agencies who have authority over other products will be looking at the CHAP report and in fact um, there are several programs at EPA who are already working on phthalates so you know I, I think that the, the CHAPs goal is, is first to say this is what we know about the risks and what's causing them. This is to number two, this is what the commission, uh, we recommend to the commission. Um, and then beyond that, uh, I, you know, I don't think it, the CHAP report is going to fall on deaf ears. I, I think that uh, EPA at least and maybe other agencies will be involved. Phil, Phil in, in my opinion, you are, you are expressing a dilemma I'm grappling with as well, or have been. Uh, the, the dilemma is this, your example is, is, is very good with, with DBP. There could be a situation where, say, the amount uh, coming out of uh, childcare products or children's toys is, um, is not very large, and uh, yet there is background exposure from other sources uh, looking at background exposure, we might come to a conclusion we are not concerned. Looking at what's coming out of child care products and children's toys, we might conclude, well, very little irrelevant. Therefore, to resolve this dilemma, the, it is practice in other areas of chemical regulation, for example, in, um, in the, um, what's it called, uh, labeling arena, where you, where you label chemical for hazard uh, purposes. To, to not consider exposures. Exposures do not enter into these considerations at all. What is solely important is to judge whether the chemical in question has a hazard profile, a, 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 a profile of toxic effects that give rise to concern and then they're regulated on that basis. And I think we should adhere to this. There's precedent for this um, and, and stick to that and that would uh, uh, resolve a couple of dilemmas and uh, focus the situation. Okay, uh, that, that clarifies things for me. Thank you. So uh, what I meant is these all these pieces of law, uh, classification, labeling, etc., etc. There's ne never ever do um, exposure considerations enter whether you want to, for example, classify a chemical as carcinogenic. It's solely based on tests, clearly described toxicological assays. Not with well, except in the U. Except in the U.S. Except yeah. in the U.S. It's absolutely wrong. Uh, you're absolutely wrong. Smoking, secondhand smoke, you're absolutely wrong in that. 
but it's in not a chemical in the sense you, you we, we have labels on on uh, cigarettes i mean my goodness we do it based upon exposure as well as toxicity i don't think smoking falls under the remit of the clp regulation which is a which is a, a worldwide piece which every well, every about country we're talking about american to. regulations and they just well the americans have to adhere to that as well <laughs> This was negotiated at UN level, so I mean, smoking may be a special special case, but let's not complicate matter, matters. If you want to look at a chemical called benzene, it is very clear it is a carcinogen, and you classify it, label it, etc., as such, or chromate, or whatever you want to say. And that's solely based on, on the outcome of toxicological tests. Mike, was there something else you were going to add? Well, yeah. just, I mean, this is a, another dilemma. Uh, Europe, the globally harmonized system, uh, have labeling that is at least primarily based on the hazard, not the risk. The, on, in the U.S., uh, and especially consumer products, everything everything is risk-based so you know we're still I, I don't know what where which way we're going to go in the future if it's going to be more toward a uh, hazard base <coughs> or not but um, I know that there is a provision in the GHS for risk-based mm -hmm. label yeah for certain cases yes but all I'm saying, I mean, we're not uh, we're not proposing to revolutionize globally harmonized systems or the CLP or whatever. Uh, we are just deriving, we're looking around what other people do and what is useful for the task at hand. And, well, I, I can only repeat myself. That's my proposal. I think it's logical. So exposure considerations should not enter this. I, I, there's no need for the panel to go on. We need a hazard index. Don't need anything. I mean, it's if you're basing it on low on toxicity, then a lot of the work we're doing, we, we don't need to do it. No, 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 no. I repeat, look, look at the charge. There are all these points which we also have to address. For these, we need the hazard index. For these, we need the exposure considerations, etc. Et for banning material, we are also expected we to, do, to do this and put it aside and just do that. I don't think that will apply. Don't think that would apply. That's why this law is written the way it is. Yeah, I mean we cannot ignore the charge here. We have to address these points. So I, I, I think I think the bottom line is by addressing those points, it puts a lot of information on the table, and we're going to account for all of that information and then make a decision. Um, and especially recognizing that exposure changes when some chemicals are banned and others are allowed or whatever exposure changes so uh, that that cannot maybe be completely foreseen so to think to base things solely on risk is unpredictable um, so going back and looking at hazard uh, information is is valuable so I you know I, I I think we're getting to the point where we're saying black and white and it's really a lot of a lot of things together that are going to be mm -hmm. put and that's what Burns list has provided sort of a <coughs> wide description I think there's a lot of shades of gray, and we just have to, we have to walk through, I think the point was made before, we have to walk through these examples and see where it leads us. I think that's a better way of looking at it, because we don't know what we're going to say in the end until we see what the data shows us. I think what is least useful is for us to give one word answer to a question <coughs> about this, and that's why I <coughs> mentioned earlier about the textual description. Mm -hmm. And for some of them, I'm sure we would emphasize hazard more than anything. And right. others, we might emphasize exposure more than anything. So I think in the context of a textual description, <coughs> we will focus on, on risk and hazard. Because that would be the best way to describe our concerns, and it may also be most useful in the future. Mm -hmm. Bern, I have another another question. Um, in terms of applying your criteria to the 16 um, 
chemicals. Um, how are we going to do that? Are, are, are you and I going to do that and then send it out to the committee for comment, or are we each going to do it separately and then fuse them together? How, how, what's the process? My suggestion would be that what each of us does this. And perhaps in the next meeting, we would spend a lot of time comparing notes, comparing thoughts, what drove us to say this or that about each chemical, combinations, whatever it is that we want to focus on. So I think that has to be a committee committee discussion to, to derive that. And I'm not sure that I want, I don't want my own opinion to, to drive, to, you know, to either accept or reject. I think it's best that we each have the opportunity. We all come to this from a slightly different leaning. I think it's best that we all do it individually and then talk about it. Other thoughts about that? I agree. I, I think whether it's the next meeting or the set or two or meetings from now, I mean, next, the next that, meeting, I think, I, I was hoping we could get more specifics in terms okay. of the toxicology chapter, the, okay, yeah. you know, so yeah. that we can base from that yeah. writing. Whenever is the right time. That I would suppose that's how we do it. Holger? Mm -hmm. I think we have all the tools we need. And let's see what the, the outcome is. <coughs> and we have seen the dilemma with the hazard index and the hazard quotient. So the hazard index might be above one. And the hazard quotient for the individual phthalates is, one, is below one, definitely below one. So we will have to discuss this, and in the end, we might have to need to look at the hazard as as it is and the risk. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Russ, are you okay with this approach? Yeah. Okay. What are, what other concerns or details? I mean, the, the I think that criteria served a purpose this morning. I think we've gotten a lot of good discussion. I, I will revisit this and try to recast this to reflect the conversation that we had this morning and put a preamble to it to give it a little better context. And again, not that we're going to do anything with it other than just read it and use it to gel things in our own minds and so that we work in a consistent manner. But there isn't anything in this set of criteria that we can't revisit as we need to case by case. But I'll take that on as one of the assignments. Another consideration about the no data concept. I would think that in many cases there are data. It's a question of what's available to us and what's public. Because there I'm assuming that there are a lot of data in regulatory agencies in the U.S. and outside the U.S. that we don't access in a literature search, but it doesn't mean there aren't any data. It just means that there's information out there that we can't access unless you get special permission from a manufacturer through an agency to be able to have access to that information. Mike, would that correctly characterize what we would find in a literature search? Yeah, yes, uh, there are, you know, data that are available, data that are not available. Yeah, so the term no, no data isn't necessarily accurate. Right. It just means no data available to us yeah. through a literature search. <clears throat> well, maybe if we are done with this, we should quit before we undo something. <laughs> well, maybe we could uh, clarify what um, our tasks will be between now and the next meeting. Yes, and uh, let's go on to the topic of assignments. And it might be good to go back and look at the outline that we have. It's very early in this notebook. And make a list the things that 
we didn't have on the outline. We already made some corrections to it earlier. What, what do, excuse me, what do we need to have homework done between now and the next meeting so that we, we have what we need? And I guess we should talk a little bit more about what, what do we expect to have in hand for the next meeting. Well, I'm, I'm going to write up the results of uh, an update of literature on the mixture effects of phthalates in animals, and also combination effects of phthalates with other chemicals, animal evidence. I think there was a table that was sent around, I haven't studied it yet, that had um, RFDs from various sources. Um, did you send that out, Mike? Yeah. It's, and I'm not sure if, if if we need additional pieces to that, or if we think that's. Did you look at it, Holder? Yeah. Well, it, it's what we. It's it's a list of all the published uh, regulatory agency reference doses, ADIs. <coughs> for how many chemicals? Uh, for a handful of phthalates, maybe half a dozen. I mean, the ones where. People have bothered to to issue those. Um, okay, so with that, um, I hope we can extend our cases um, to include uh, maybe not just anti-androgenicity activity, but whatever the guidelines are based on, the reference sources are based on by maybe the EU and the uh, EPA. Yeah. Now the uh, the problem the EPA ones are probably out of date date or may be out of date, they will have new ones, a draft new ones in the fall. But anyway, um, you know, if they look like they're way different, it's probably just because they're old, if they're different from everybody else's. But also, um, yeah, you know, look, if you're look, going to look at individual chemicals or if you're going to look at DEP, which, or a phthalate that's not anti-androgenic, you, you probably would look at the most sensitive endpoint, which is something else. And Chris, it's my intention to develop uh, RFDs for developmental toxicology for each of the ones that I can. So that would be helpful um, maybe to add to this table. Um, do you, do you have a time frame in mind, Phil, that um, it would be, I mean... Um, I should be able to get that done, uh, you know, at least by the end of next month. So that should give us time then to go ahead and, and expand our cases. Yeah, I think we should work on this together, Phil. You should check the vendors yep. we use and double check them. We, you should check whether our case one approach, is, the one basically based on, on Andrea's work, is okay, or if maybe case two with the Earl Gray's data is okay. Uh, right. Because, you know, you don't, obviously the CHAP can derive its own uh, ADIs. It's, it, you don't have to use, you know, EPAs or anybody else's. I think given that, that our charge is to do this de novo, it probably would be a good idea for us to to derive these uh, ourselves as well. Yeah, actually our case two approach is a de novo approach based on the presentations from Earl Grey, Paul Foster and uh, Prelim also preliminary data. So that's really the noble approach. Okay, another assignment that we agreed to for some of us <coughs> was to come up with summary tables of the information from our sections. 
that will dovetail into what some of the rest of you are working on so that we can go back and forth between there. So that that's maybe that's you, Russ, and Phil, and me in particular, the, the three of us. We will have new literature reviews on literature reviews on chemicals that we haven't seen before coming from Bursar. And when would you expect those, Mike? Um, we hope to have drafts by the end of April. Uh -oh. And we could send you the drafts as they come in. Okay. Individual phthalates risk assessment with the daily intakes related to the TDIs, RDS. So we'll do, we'll split our cumulative approach into the single phthalates, but most of the data basically is there. Okay. It'll be a de novo approach too, based on the individual RFDs we deduce from current data. Are we going to actually get estimates of exposure for things that we don't have biomonitoring data for, um, for the full 16 or 17, whatever the number was, list? Depends upon the data that's available. I mean, it all depends upon what we have in terms of the product um, formulations and whether or not we have um, data that can be used substantially in terms of looking at titration or, you know, what would happen when you uh, apply it. Yeah, sure. If, it, if it's available, we'll get it. If it's not, <coughs> we can't. I, I think the answer is for some you'll get pretty good data. Yeah. For others, it you may get a limited range of scenarios. I you know, I'm thinking the substitutes <coughs> I'm thinking in, <coughs> in terms of just the products that see, you know, we have data on the children's products that CPSC tested. I don't know, is there a need to go beyond that? I don't know. So it may be difficult to get total daily yeah. intake estimates for Yeah, some and then as you, you know, as you go down the list of phthalates, you're gonna get fewer and fewer right. data of any kind. Are we interested in trying to approach, you know, the, the substitution effect to try to look at exposure predictions as some chemicals go out of the market, others are used? We'll be able to get some. Uh, we'll be able to get, if they're comparable products, we should be able to do comparative analysis. The, pre, the previous value we need to substitute. If we have the data, we can do a comparative analysis using the same basic calculations of exposure. So, but it sounds like the, this time frame of this is not going to be between now and the next meeting, that you guys are... We're supposed to, the data acquisition process, which Mike and I are outlined, because it is substantial, hopefully will be done by the end of May. And you and I are meeting with, hopefully, Mount Lauber and the three of us will go over how the exposure assessment will be done beginning of June, and then from then on, there'll be a cranking of the estimate. That's where I think that's where we are. Because it is, it is a time consuming process getting this data. So I think we have a reasonable timeline based upon what we know will be a difficult task. We have some now, but as I said yesterday, we want more. And um, that I think is a reasonable timeline. So I would assume, for, from the standpoint of having data available, might be at the end of late middle July. Once we get our act together, I, I would hope so. Yeah. So the comparison to the biomonitoring results and uh, a, sort of combining the, the the two together for maybe additional chemicals that's further down in the I, summer I think, and fall. Well, We're not going to no, be no, doing I don't that. Think that, that I think if as we get data, we can actually give you information on the more 
he went to the higher tier and stuff. It seems yeah. possible. And then as other things come out, we'll, we'll give it to you. But yeah, we'll work on the top six first and then go from there. Yeah, or at least a draft or, yeah. you know. No, I don't want to leave you guys hanging until the fall. That would be unfortunate. Well, you got my summer. <laughs> Here we are. Any other pieces that we talked about filling in? What I have right now for assignments, <coughs> Andreas will be working on the literature review of the animal evidence of the effects of combinations. Phil and Russ and I will be working on summary tables for our areas. <coughs> New literature reviews are going to be coming from CPSC that will drive further of the same thing that we've been doing but just on more chemicals. Uh, lists of Updates of RFDs and generation of new RFDs by Chris and Holger working with working with Phil. And Holger and Chris doing more hazard index evaluations in the meantime and on individual <coughs> and groups. Mike, one thing that I still think is needed is a list of chemicals that we have now agreed upon. Yeah with their molecular weights and with their cast numbers. We really want to have just yeah. one such list in the report. Yeah, and I think with the understanding that everything on that list, you know, maybe it doesn't show up in biomonitoring or some, you know, it, or you might not find exposure data. I mean, yeah. it, we will each address those chemicals to the, you know, everybody will address those chemicals as, you know, the best they can. I mean, if it's not in the epi studies, then you can't address it. But we need to know that there are no epi studies yeah. on that. So if we, we don't, we're not silent on it, there's nothing there. We, we need to know that there is nothing there for that endpoint. Okay, and then one more thing, the one that Paul talked about last, Paul and Mike working on continue with the exposure data. So I think those are those are the assignments. And if I look forward three months to what we get from those assignments, we're not doing anything new in a revolutionary sense that we haven't done before, but we're filling in. And we're adding pieces as we go to what we've already begun as a format for the report. And I would expect that we would spend a day and a half next time going in more detail over the materials that we have in the report and less time talking about the overall approach that we're going to use to do this. And we'll, we will, next time will be more detail on the actual contents of the report and then the discussions that come out of that. Now, <clears throat> I, what we need to talk about dates for a meeting in the last two weeks of July. And you know, one thing that we talked about that I'm not sure we've gotten in front of you yet is the desire then to begin to talk about the, not just the next meeting, but the next four meetings. Not dates for the other three, but if we have a meeting the first, sometime the first two weeks of July, then the next meeting would be in October, and then the meeting after that would be January, February time frame, and then the meeting after that would be April. So just to block out what we're going to do for the next year so that we can begin to pencil in times for meetings beyond the next one, that, that's what we're looking at. And we'll have to, each next time we'll have to talk about specific dates for the October meeting. But if somebody is going, knows now that they'll be going all of October, uh, out of pocket, out of all, all of October, it would be helpful to know that now. 
I'll be out of town in Europe in the second half of October. Second half of October. So <coughs> we're out to the first half of October. But for now, let's let's try to get a, a date for a meeting <coughs> in the two weeks of, in the second two weeks of July. Second two weeks of July. The first. Two oh, I'm sorry. The, the first. The last two weeks of July. There's a National Academy of Sciences meeting on mixtures the 27th and 28th that I'm involved with. So we could meet before. 25th, 26th? Good for me. Good for me. We're talking about the 20th. 5th and 26th of July. Of July. It's okay yeah. with me. That's a Monday and a Tuesday. Yeah. I think that's good for me too. Just a second. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's okay with me. <laughs> <laughs> Russ? Yes. It works. Okay. Let, let's so, let's see. July 25 and 26. It's photocopy. Mike, is that okay? It's okay for our peer? Yeah. Virgin Territory. Okay. I'm going to have to fly in the morning. So I mean, can do it in the night. <coughs> Hopefully, I'm going to be right down in the evening. I'm not going to be well, it was helpful to have everybody here first thing yeah. Monday morning. I think it gave us a couple hours to start on the meeting. But if people can't be here, that's a different time. So it sounds like we're okay for July 25 and 26. Mm -hmm. And I, I think it would be futile to try to set dates for October and beyond. But if you can, you know, like we already know that the second two weeks in October are a problem for Paul. I'm, I'm here on 21st, 22nd anyway for this International Toxicology of Mixtures meeting, so... October. In October, yeah. So it would, be <coughs> to, it would suit me well to combine this. So if we met on the 18th and the 19th of October? Perfect. I, I can't. I have another okay. meeting. Yeah. Otherwise we're into a weekend. What about to do the 24th? I'll be in Europe. You're in Europe? Mm -hmm. Yes, if, if mm -hmm. I'm in just Europe from about the 16th through the 29th. Mm -hmm. Well, but you're not here for the, if we look like looked at the 24th and 25th, you're not here anyhow. Mm -hmm. We may not be able to match up with your meeting members. Okay. Yes. And so the 17th and 18th doesn't work either? No, um, I have uh, American Society of Reproductive Medicine from the 15th through the 19th. What about some two days of the week of the 10th of October? Should work. The only thing I'll, I teach in the fall, so I just have to. I don't know what my sure. schedule is in the fall. I yeah. teach Tuesdays, Thursdays, but not every four, not every five. Okay. But I could check I, I, when I get back, or I have the syllabus. Okay. Yeah. I'll have to check that too. <coughs> Phil, are you available on the week of the 10th of October? Yeah, I'm, I'm teaching only Wednesday and Friday, but I can work around that. 10th of October. Mm -hmm. That's a holiday. Yeah, when I get to figure out when the holiday is. Columbus Day is this the 10th. 10th. Yeah, so that yeah. would be not a good day. Well, yeah. you know, 12th or 13th. I just have to check my teaching schedule. I don't know. You have a yeah. joint drug commission meeting in Berlin. You have, you have a conflict? Yeah. Conflict. yeah. No, On well, the 12th and 13th? 13th, 14th. Thank you. 
And Monday is a holiday. Mm -hmm. yes. So, 17th, 18th of October was out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I assume that September is cutting it too close. Yeah, I don't think we'll be ready in time. Yeah. The first week of November. That means we're into November. <coughs> Let's see, October. Can we roll out the first week in October? Not yet, Bill. Fifth is bad. Fifth is bad for me. The, the tenth is bad. Yeah, I think that week is, is lost. First week. I'm available the first week in October. Mm -hmm. That could work for me. So, October 6th, 7th? Or? October 6th and 7th would be a possibility. 7th is not. Seventh is what? Not good. Yeah. The fifth, the sixth. Um, October fifth and sixth. Fifth <coughs> is bad for me. The fifth, October fifth is bad. For me. Third, third and fourth. What is the least bad? I mean, uh, I know Paul counted my twenty fourth, twenty fifth, but who else counted my twenty fourth, twenty fifth? October. Yeah. <coughs> the IECS conference in Baltimore from the 23rd to the 27th. Yeah, another. And yes, so you are there. So you're going? I'm going I'm definitely. I can't. I'm going to Europe, but that is a that is a conflict. Who again? Who again couldn't make it before? Uh, say any day between 17th of October <coughs> and 20th. I know, Paul, you can't make mm -hmm. it. I can't. I have a reproductive medicine meeting mm -hmm. from the 15th through the 19th. Mm -hmm. Just for rough month. It's terrible. Well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it is terrible. what I would suggest is that we, we collect information from your calendars for October and the first week of November. Yeah. And we may have to decide what, what is the best time where we can get everybody but one? Yeah. We could just send this uh, spreadsheet around again, if you like. That's very sure. helpful. So we'll do yeah. from October, we'll do October, November? Yeah. What about the first week in November? The 31st is bad for me. But other than that. Yeah, 31st, I can't either. Well, the 31st of October. Yeah. But, but later that week would be fine. The other days in the first week of yeah. November? <coughs> the latter part of it would be reasonable. Would be yeah, Thursday, Friday, yeah. Is the third and fourth? Good or bad? It's good. That's reasonable. Third. The third and fourth of November? <coughs> yeah, that's his time. Yeah. Just done. Is there agreement on yep. the third and fourth? Yeah, let's take this quickly. Is it a miracle? Yes. Phil, is that okay with you? Uh, that's good for me. Let's, let's mark down the 3rd and 4th of November. Good for you. I'll have to, to just make sure with teaching yeah. on, the, on the Thursday, but I know the 4th is definitely good. So. Shall we pass it to you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or ink. Ink it in on your computer. <laughs> Permanent. <coughs> Permanent ink. Yeah, look. Well, that is helpful. Should we try for more? No. <coughs> no, I don't, I don't think so. We'll save that fun for next time. things that I had in mind for this morning. Do we have time for anything else you want to bring up? <clears throat>
Anybody? Mm -hmm. Bill, anything from you? No, I think that's it. Mike, anything from your side? Uh, no, I think we're okay. Um, I, I assume Lisa has talked to you about it, whatever travel vouchers or whatever you need to do. So other than that, we're good. Did you give us travel vouchers? No. Did she give you anything? I'll, I'll check with her. No, no. No, she hasn't said the review about travel no. Okay. Just travel to the airport. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll make sure there isn't anything else. But, well, thank you. Yeah, if there's nothing else, I think. Thank you all. Thank you, Byrne, for filling in. Yeah. Yeah. In Phil's absence. By email. Yeah, and thank you all Bye. for coming. Bill? Brother? Yes. Would you give me uh, after the meeting is uh, over? Yeah, wait, you're breaking up all you after the meeting? Yes, please. Yes, I will. All right. Well, I guess we're adjourned. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you. <laughs>